Hey everyone, good evening and welcome to the EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and an ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm an active volunteer at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County, and I have the honor of serving as one of the assistant medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Justin Nesbaum and the medical director's office, Chief Nats, EMS office, EMS Academy, EMS Training Academy staff, and Captain Lenny Stewart, thank you for what you guys every day do every day to help our community. And thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Shout out to Ashley Brooks, a young member at Pikesville as well, who's helping us with our uh, Zoom platform. Ashley, after the latter part of the training, we'll put a link in the chat. Click on the link, enter some information, and get your MIM CEUs. Again, if you want your MIM CEUs, Ashley will put a link in the uh, chat later in this session, and we will announce it as well. If you have any concerns getting your MIM CEUs, questions about your participation record, uh, you can't get your information into the form, please hang out with us after this training. We're unable to adjust the roster after this training is closed this evening. Super excited to have with us back again, uh, Matt Goldstein. Matt is a physician assistant with over 20 years of experience in cardiology and emergency medicine. Matt volunteers as a paramedic in Baltimore and coordinates a Maryland statewide public access AED program. His American Heart Association Training Center Startbeat LLC has trained thousands in CPR, first aid, use of the AED, ACLS, and PALS. Matt has been an invited speaker at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, American Association of Critical Care Nurses, and American Academy of Physician Assistants, as well as other national groups. He has authored a book, Topics in Electrophysiology, Heart Rhythms, and 12 lead EKG, sold on Amazon, as well as authored several articles in cardiovascular topics and peer-reviewed journals and has presented his research at international scientific sessions with the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Cardiology. Matt, thanks for being with us tonight and being so generous with your time and your talent. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for uh, pumping me up. Uh, and thanks everyone who joined. So today's uh, part two of the 12 EDKG. Tonight, we're going to primarily speak about what mimics a STEMI, but we'll do a quick review of what we did last time in part one. So we'll start off with just a quick review of how we interpret an EKG of what actually is a STEMI, and then we'll get into what mimics a STEMI. If I could make my slide go forward. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if you remember, we had some 12 EDKG basics. So when we look at a 12 EDKG, we know that we have the EKG actually correlates to areas of the heart, which are fed by specific blood vessels. And so this is very anatomical. And so when we look at an EKG and we look at the inferior area, which is which are two, three and AVF, we're looking at an area that's fed by a branch of the RCA, as you can see in the picture. When we look at the high lateral wall, we're looking at the circumflex and that's one in AVL. When we look at the septum, V1 and V2, which is usually included V3 and V4 with, for anterior, which is the LAD. And then the low lateral wall is sort of uh, everyone's land, we'll say, is V5 and V6, which is the low lateral wall, which could be the LAD. It could be a long circumflex. It could be a long branch of the RCA. And then we said that that cartoon, we can sort of put it onto an EKG. And when we look at the EKG, we are going to divide it into those neighborhoods or there's those territories. But again, it's very specific to a blood vessel feeding that area. We talked about ST segment elevation. So when we look at that ST segment, so right at the end of the QRS complex until the T wave is the ST segment. And we're going to we're going to be looking at things like ST segment elevation. Now, we said that what I call an insult to the heart, we have three different findings. We have ischemia, injury, and infarction. When we talk about ischemia, we're talking about things like ST segment depression, inverted T waves, flattening of T waves. We talk about injury, we're talking about ST segment elevation. We talk about infarction, we're talking about Q waves. Now, again, we don't generally differentiate between injury slash infarction because we call something an MI. And when we talk about MI, we're talking about myocardial infarction, but we're referring to their injury pattern. So let's just collectively put those together and say MI is when there's ST segment elevation, 
And if it's older, so maybe 24 hours old, you start having Q waves. Now, when we have, uh, when I have the pictures under infarction, so again, we don't know if that's something that started yesterday morning or if that person had an MI and now is having a second MI that's acute on, so to speak, chronic. And so that's why it's a lot easier just to say, are they having an MI, collectively injury slash infarction, versus ischemia? And then we said that the challenge is there's whole, a whole bunch of different things that can cause somebody to have these findings on the EKG. And a lot of these additional things are, are what we're gonna address tonight because they sort of look like an MI, but they're not an MI. And the way we're going to sort of sort out easily what those things are that don't that aren't necessarily an MI is we're gonna look at this concept, is it a global issue or is it a focal issue? So we know that if I have, let's say, digoxin in my body, all areas of my EKG are going to be affected by the effects of digoxin or hyperkalemia or hypothermia. So those would be a global issue, right? I'm not gonna have selective filtering of blood to one specific area of the heart. So those are generally a global type of a problem. If I have an MI, then that's usually caused by a single culprit lesion, and that would then create a focal issue. So a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is sort of going to be second nature to you because we're going to be looking at something, and be like, oh, that's global. But still, there are some very common things that trick people into thinking it's an MI when it's not. So I sort of uh, brought in the concept last time that STEMIs, it's sort of a wave type of appearance. I brought the idea in that things that are at the beach are things that are uh, the, the sort of the morphology, the shape of some beach-like things are suggestive of an MI. And then there's one other, which is the water slide that you can see here. And the water slide is not necessarily at the beach. And so what I had mentioned, and we'll talk about water slides more tonight, what I had mentioned is that if I'm in Ocean City and I'm walking on the boardwalk and I see out of one side of my eyes, I see the hotels with a pool with a water slide. So when I see that, I'm at the beach and I see a water slide. But the only way I know I'm at the beach is out of my other side of my eye, so to speak. I see a surfboard. I see a lifeguard chair. You might see a shark. You might see a beach ball. So when I see all these other things, then I sort of connect that water slide to the beach. But if you're at a hotel up in Owings Mills, you might have a water slide that's not associated with the beach. So I sort of need the other beach-like items to pull that water slide into the beach. If not, an isolated water slide is not, does not have a beach theme. And what we're gonna suggest is that things that are at the beach, like a shark, like a surfboard, like a lifeguard chair, those are things that are concerning morphology, a shape that's concerning when the water slide is only concerning when it's pulled into the beach. So the water slide only concerns us if I'm at Ocean City. The water slide doesn't con concern me if it's isolated up in a hotel in Owings Mills or in someone's backyard. So that's sort of the idea that we that we uh, talked about last time. And then just to review, you always have to have the SC segment elevation in order to have this hold true. But you could have the hammock. You could have SC segment elevation that looks like a surfboard. You could have SC segment elevation that looks like a lifeguard chair looks like a beach ball with that round appearance. But then you have the water slide, which again, the water slide could be an MI, but if it's only, if there are only water slides that it's suggestive probably that it's not an MI. And one thing you'll notice is the appearance of the water slide is what they call concave. Concave means it caves in. I don't know if that's what it means, but it definitely, it, it, it does mean that. Concave means it caves in. So do you see how it's like a water slide with the appearance 
it caves in, as opposed to convex, which would be sort of rounding out uh, the opposite way, not caved in. So we'll refer to that a little bit later as well. And then we said sharks are bad, right? Sharks, sharks are rarely at the beach. But if a shark is at the beach, then it could be very deadly. So that shark fin appearance is bad, as you see in this EKG right here. Now, I, I think we got we have to give us all our, ourselves all credit. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to take that EKG and be like, "Oh yeah, we don't got a problem." I think everyone's uh, well in tune. That's a, a pretty a pretty bad looking EKG. So a few rules, we said that what stays in one neighbor, what happens in one neighborhood stays in that neighborhood. So which means that if you have a problem in one area, so for example, in the inferior leads, you have two, three and AVF, then you have, you should have two of the three leads have the problem. Or if you have an area that has, let's say two leads, like uh, let's say V5 and V6, you would expect to see the problem in both of them. Because again, it's very territorial. So you wouldn't have an isolated issue to one lead in the EKG. And when we talked about global versus focal, we talked about the concept of reciprocal changes. So you, if you have an opposite appearance in the opposite area, that means that you have reciprocal change. You don't have to have reciprocal changes. However, normally, uh, quite often, or, or usually you do. And when you do have reciprocal changes, it sort of confirms your theory that the problem is focal as opposed to global. So these different areas here, you can see where I circled in blue are reciprocal to the red and, and vice versa. <clears throat> There's something called nonspecific changes on the EKG. You'll hear someone say that someone has nonspecific changes either because the changes don't add up anatomically or there are some sort of normals that are that have an abnormal appearance. And what I'm referring to is lead three. In lead three, it's very common and normal to have a non-ischemic, non if you will, inverted T waves, uh, as is in V1. So that's something just to, to note to self. So we went through last time, we talked about approaching an EKG like a puzzle. First thing we said was, what's the rhythm? What's the rate? Then we broke it into neighborhoods. And then within each neighborhood, we said, do we have any evidence of ischemia, injury, infarction? And then we asked ourselves, does that appear global or focal where I have my, where I, where I have my concerns? Are there reciprocal changes to support my theory that the problem is focal? And then we asked ourselves, does it make sense anatomically? And where we left off last time was we said, is, are there anything, anything on that EKG? Is there something that mimics an acute MI that I'm sort of going to give my EKG that final hug before I pick up the, the radio and get on with EMRC and tell the hospital I have a STEMI alert? Is there something there that I just want to take a, another quick look and see, is there something there that mimics an MI that I sort of bought into, and it's really not an MI. Matt, there's a question that yeah. says, what causes only one lead to show an abnormal QRS? So, so in, in other words, an ST segment in one lead as opposed to other so, some other finding that's not a STEMI. So we have a whole list of things. Some other finding, sometimes it's just artifact. Lead placement. Yeah, lead placement could be. So I'm just skipping through because we did this is exactly what we just ran through. But then we get to sort of tonight's topic: what mimics an MI? And so there are a few big ones that I pulled out as far as things that mimic MI. I, I, I looked at some of the literature to see uh, what else there others are saying mimics an MI, and those are the things we're going to talk about this evening. And note to self, don't trust the machine. However, I'm going to show you in a minute that trusting the machine, sometimes uh, the machines are pretty good. So I'll show you sort of what the rates of false positives, false negatives with trusting the machine, because I know a lot of what we do is we kind of, first thing we do when we get that EKG is we look at what the machine's telling us. And, you know, the question is, is that a good idea or not? So I tell people, you have to be able to verify what the machine's telling you, 
because if the machines were completely reliable, then you wouldn't be needed, right? So you're needed. And so we're not going to be able to rely only on the machines in, in 2023 going into 2024. Now in the future, that might change. So uh, quality is important. So if it looks like junk, it's probably junk. So we're not going to rely on poor quality and we're going to do a repeat EKG if we have poor quality. So here's a field case. I don't remember if I shared this last time. Um, this is a case when I was working in an emergency room. So I worked in one ER that was in the county, one ER that was in the city. So I'm not going to call anyone out. Uh, so you won't be able to figure out uh, where the unit was. But uh, neither centers that I was at were, were interventional at the time. And this was a patient that was brought in. And the patient was brought in to a non-interventional center with the diagnosis of chest pain, but the EKG was uh, viewed as non, not as a STEMI. And as we're all looking at this EKG, we're saying, you know, there's definitely an inferior MI look there, right? So this is where, and even a posterior MI look going on there with the ST segment depression, V1, V2, V3. Um, so this is a very concerning EKG, but if you only were reading the what the machine told you, then you would have done as the unit that brought this patient in did, and they completely missed the STEMI. And we're better than that, so we don't want to, to be doing that. Now, what happened was, as the EKG machine even said, it said that there's suspected reversal of the leads. And so when it was corrected, the EKG looks the same, right? Pretty much, they're having a big... MI, they're having a inferior and probably posterior MI. And so sometimes it's uh, there could be some user error and not just machine error. So note that to self. And field case number two, this is a case that was called in as a STEMI. And uh, really the problem that there was is that this is a roller coaster effect, right? So you want to get a good qual high quality EKG because that was viewed right there as where the STEMI was, right? But the problem is, is that there's a wandering baseline and that tricked the person who was looking at the EKG and that tricked the machine as well to read that as a STEMI. So I'll tell you what I used to tell a residents when I taught uh, 12 lead in, in the hospital. And I used to say that, you know, the machine's giving you a whole lot of information. If you disagree with the machine, that's fine. And, and you're a human and you're smarter than the machine. However, you better be right if you're arguing with the machine. So if the machine says on top, you know, STEMI, and you don't think there's a STEMI, again, that's fine. The machine does make mistakes, but you better be right before you tuck that EKG away in the chart and, and move on to your next patient because the machines are pretty good. Okay, so that brings us into the, the, the main topic of tonight. So what mimics a STEMI? So I found this online, uh, not that it was a uh, peer-reviewed journal type of a website, but the website looked pretty good. So I didn't see where they got this information from. But basically, the things that mimic a STEMI, there's just a few that are common. So left, ventri left ventricular hypertrophy is, is the big one. That's 25%, and we're going to go through an easy way to determine if it's if it's LVH. Left bundle branch blocks, which again, we all know in, a, in their own right, a left bundle branch block could be a STEMI. So if you have a brand new left bundle branch block, which we don't always have the luxury of knowing that with our patients, that is that is that could be sort of, it's not called a STEMI, but it's an acute MI with a new left bundle branch block. So it's sort of the an alternative to a STEMI, so to speak. But left bundle branch blocks that are old, they often confuse people with a STEMI. Early repolarization, which again, is really a big one. And then to some extent, right bundle branch blocks. Ventricular aneurysms, again, is kind of irrelevant to us in the field because uh, if they have ventricular aneurysm versus having a, a, a STEMI, uh, they're gonna end up in the same place anyhow. Uh, hyperkalemia, and then there are some others that are less common. Uh, so 
the others really we don't need to talk much about. Uh, pericarditis is one that uh, we do see. Uh, hypothermia, hopefully you don't really see. Uh, Non-ischemic vasospasms. So sometimes you'll the person will just have a vasospasm. So something will look like like a real MI, and again, it's only one percent of the time, and it's not really it's not really an MI. When they get to the cath lab, everything was clean, but it looked like an MI, and they suggested that they had a vasospasm. Forgotta syndrome. You know, my my problem is that there's like uh, everyone has named something after themselves. And so if uh, everyone's names uh, fascinate you, you can you can Google what that what that might look like. Uh, but again, only one percent of the time. And so the big ones are the ones that sort of the, the top five or six on the page, which are what we're going to talk about tonight, which are not that difficult to differentiate between them and other things. So false positives. So of I found this uh, this uh, this paper, that, that says that there was 411 STEMIs uh, activated, uh, or, or 411 STEMIs that the ER physicians activated the cath lab for, and 146 of them were false positives. This, again, this was one hospital. It could be that they this didn't have a good ER group. I don't know. But uh, it's not uncommon to have false positives. This was a little extreme as far as uh, an ER calling in false positives. Uh, but that means that a third of the patients that they called in as a STEMI from the ER did not have a STEMI. So perhaps the hospital uh, maybe needed a little quality assurance or, or some, some further education, uh, because I'm gonna show you in a minute that uh, pre-hospital uh, were a lot better than that in the pre-hospital area. So a study of 1,736 STEMI cases, there was uh, the ER had a false positive rate of 5.4. So when we say false positive, we're saying the amount of times that the person goes is called a STEMI, but after they get to the cath lab, they weren't a STEMI. So in this case, a much larger study, but not a huge study, there was a false positive rate of 5.4% for the emergency room and pre-hospital only had a false positive rate of 2.75 as far as their STEMIs. Now, the question then is how about false negatives, right? So you're thinking, okay, well, EMS people, we don't have a whole lot of false positives. Well, then I would say, well, maybe you have a, a, a boatload of false negatives and that would be really bad, right? Because then you're not calling enough of these uh, STEMI. So there was a meta-analysis of paramedics interpreting a 12 lead EKG from four different studies. And the false positive rate from paramedics, meaning times you thought there was a STEMI and it really wasn't, 38 cases per thousand, which was only 4%. And here, this speaks to my, to, to my original concern of, well, then obviously you're not gonna have a lot of false positives, if you have an incredible amount of false ne negatives, right? So you're missing a whole lot of MIs, then you're you're sort of, you know, who cares what the false positive rate is if you're missing a whole lot of them. But the same, the same study showed the false negatives was only 13 per thousand. It's so only 1%. So that would suggest that paramedics do a pretty good job interpreting a 12 lead EKG. And you know, in the in the ER's defense of things, uh, you know, the ER has to err a lot more on the side of caution because they're talking about sending the person home, sending the person to the medical floor. When we're concerned with, are we driving him to the hospital to the ER, or are we driving him to the hospital to the ER? So, you know, I can understand why the emergency room uh, is more cautious uh, after being on that end for 18 years as well. So. Uh, but again, you can see from this from this study, which was which was from four larger studies, that the false positive rate by paramedics is fairly low, and the false negative rate is is almost non-existent. So how about the machine? So I thought this was interesting. So how about the machine? Like, why don't we just listen to the machine, or should we listen to the machine, or should we? really weigh in what the machine tells us 
when we're using our own interpretation. So this was a really interesting study. It was a review of 44,611 LifePak 15 EKGs acquired by the Los Angeles Fire Department between July 2011 and June 2012. So one year of all the EKGs in, in Los Angeles, essentially. And there were 482 true positives. So the machine read 482 true positives. And by the way, each of these EKG was independently read by three cardiologists who didn't have any idea what the other cardiologists said. And so the idea is that you know, they, these are pretty well confirmed. And so there was 1.1% of true positives. There was 1.6% false positives. There were 97.2% true negatives. And there was only 47 false negatives. So basically, the machine errs on the side of caution. It had about an equal, or, or I shouldn't say equal, but there was a little more false positives and true positives, which would tell you if the machine says that it's something that sometimes it's not. But on the other hand, if the machine tells you that there's nothing wrong, there was 0.1% as far as that. So 47 cases, the machine read it as negative and it wasn't out of 44,611. So if the machine says there's nothing going on, it's, it's probably okay. Now, what were the reasons for the machine's false positives? Artifact, 20% of the time, which is what I showed you before. Early repolarization, 16% of the time. Pericarditis, it was indeterminate, 12% of the time. Left ventricular hypertrophy, 8% of the time. And right bundle branch, 5% of the time. So, so where you see, what you can see, though, is it's the same common themes as far as things that trick us and things that trick the EKG. But... Uh, machine, but the bottom line is we do a good job in determining what's false, what what are positives and what are negatives, and the machine does a pretty good uh, pretty good job picking out when there's nothing wrong. So what were things that tricked the machine? So ST segment elevation it didn't meet the machine's algorithm threshold. So in other words, if there was like, let's say uh, three quarters of a millimeter of ST segment elevation, the machine's cutoff was one millimeter. And it sort of has that feel of ST segment elevation, but the machine didn't see it as that. That was the, the primary reason for the machine thinking there was, there was nothing wrong. But again, it was a very small number anyhow. And then if the person had very tall T waves, that caused an STT ratio that was low, right? So the, the T wave made the sort of dwarfed the, the ST segment and then the machine missed it. And that was 15% of the time. But again, very, very low numbers. So if the machine says there's nothing going on, then there's probably nothing going on. But again, we're going to weigh in ourselves. If the machine says that there's something going on, there's probably something going on. It might not be a STEMI. Uh, and, but also we saw from the Los Angeles study that it takes a lot of EKGs that we do on our patients to really have that EKG that has a problem. So some of us might have one STEMI in a whole year, right? I mean, just think of Los Angeles, they had what, 400 and something STEMIs in the entire, in the entire year. And so it's not something that you just, every call you go on, you see a STEMI. So we're back to sort of my cardiology outline. We're looking at, uh, Tonight, we're going to look at things that are electrical problems, plumbing problems, mechanical problems, all different things could cause uh, SC segment uh, changes that are maybe not a STEMI. So that's, again, what we're going to focus on tonight. Is there something that mimics an acute MI? So, again, same common theme, excuse me, same common theme from the different, from the different studies we talked about and different things from the from the web, left bundle branch blocks. Again, don't forget, that could be an MI in its own right, if it's acute. Left ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular paste, wide complex rhythms, like aberrant rhythms or ventricular rhythms, early repolarization, which was a big one, 
pericarditis, and artifacts. So let's run through what these things might be. So again, we 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 always have to remember the left bundle branch alone could be an, an MI, but it also could mimic an MI. Because I look at this EKG, I clearly see what looks like sort of the feel of ST segment elevation. Now, it has that concave water slide look. So uh, right away, that is sort of my theory holds true uh, that this would not be a STEMI because it's isolated as far, I'm sorry, it's not isolated, but because it's only water slides, uh, but it's just uh, something of note. So let's talk about bundle branch blocks. I know we all learned this in uh, in our in our training, uh, but let's just run through to refresh our to refresh our ourselves. So in a normal heart, we have that SA node fires and the impulse uh, heads on through the atrium and it goes to that AV nodal area and then goes down the right and the left bundle branch at the same time in the normal person's heart and. Hopefully, when an area gets depolarized, you get contractility following suit, and that's where you get that nice squeeze, that non-lopsided squeeze of the ventricles. So in a left bundle branch block, the right ventricle receives the impulse before the left, and left bundle branch blocks usually indicate an underlying cardiac pathology. I only know of like two patients that I've ever dealt with they had absolutely nothing wrong with them, and they had a left bundle branch block. So, so it's it usually indicates that there's some cardiac pathology going on. Now, a left bundle branch block, you can mem if you're a criteria memorizer, you can memorize that criteria, and I uh, guarantee you it won't help you in practice. And so we're going to go through the down and dirty ways of telling if the person has a left bundle branch block versus a right bundle branch block. But as you can see in my picture. One side is blocked, so the impulse goes down one side, the side that's not blocked, and then carries over to the other side, which actually also gives you a lopsided type of a contractility. And so you have patients who have, uh, you've heard of a patient who has a biventricular pacemaker, and that's because they have heart failure and they have a low ejection fraction and their heart's out of sync. And that biventricular pacemaker can actually bring their heart back in sync because then you're sort of getting rid of the bundle branch block artificially by stimulating the right and the left at the same time. And you're giving, you're sort of giving that nice contractility all, all together. So this is an example of that lopsided appearance of a left bundle branch block. And so you can see how the heart sort of is not getting that good squeeze together. Now, right bundle branch blocks, they happen when the right bundle branch is blocked and the left ventricle gets the impulse first. Now, this does not necessarily mean that the person has underlying cardiac pathology. Now, it could be in a healthy individual could have a right bundle branch block. It could be from coronary artery disease. It could be from lung disease, pulmonary embolism, cardiomyopathy. It could be from an atrial and ventricular septal defect. And so there are different reasons for right bundle branch. So we used, uh, so we, we used to say is we had someone with the right bundle branch block, we'd say, okay, uh, everyone's entitled to one workup, sort of that initial workup for the right bundle branch block. And then once you did that workup and the person tells you that they have a right bundle branch block, then we sort of say, okay, that's their right bundle branch block and that's not a big deal from, from there. But everyone who has a new onset of right bundle branch block needs to get a workup to make sure that they're a healthy individual versus someone who has something that's very, very unhealthy. Un and so again, if you're a criteria person, you can memorize the criteria, but you can see here again, the impulse goes down the left and then carries over to the right. So this is the way we learned in, in uh, ALS school back in the day, and this is probably the, the way to remember it the easiest, and that is you're driving a car and you are facing the steering wheel and you're looking out in front of you and you have an EKG in front of you. And if you look at V1, and this is where I see people make an error, this only holds true in V1. So if you look in V1, 
So again, it doesn't, it's not helpful if you're looking at V6 or you're looking at lead three, it's only V1. You're looking at the terminal component of the QRS complex, meaning you're looking where I have those red arrows. You're looking at the end part of the QRS complex, the final part of the QRS complex. If the final part of the QRS complex is facing downward, that's like you're turning your car to the left, right? You're turning your blinker, you're making a left-hand turn, you push your blinker down. And so if it's downwards, it's a left bundle branch block. If it's upwards, it's a right bundle branch block. Now, again, all this block stuff only holds true when the QRS complex is greater than, in the adult, greater than three small boxes or equal to or greater than three small boxes. So if it's not greater than three small boxes, meaning 0.12 seconds, then it's not a bundle branch block. It could be an incomplete bundle branch block, but it's not a bundle branch block. So we're not, this isn't necessarily gonna, we're not gonna use this uh, for that purpose. Now I think of a different way. And that is, I say to myself, which leads on the EKG are most to the right of the person? of the heart and which leads on the EKG are most to the left of the person. And this holds true most of the time. And so what I say is on the right side of the EKG, if you will, meaning V1 or V2 versus the left side of the EKG or left isthmus side of the EKG, V5 and V6, I say, is there a notch? Is there like a W look, like an M look? Does it look funky? meaning it's not just like a QRS, there's some other thing going on over there. If it's funky on the right, then it's a right bundle branch block. If it's funky on the left, it's the left bundle branch block. So what am I talking about? So I look at this one. So where is it notched? Is it notched on the left or is it notched on the right? Well, you see in V5, it has that little notch. So it's a left bundle branch block. Matt, can you use now, the meter? Can I use Your can pointer. you see me? Can you see me pointing right now? Keep going. How Keep would going. I how would I do that? I feel like I see it and then it goes off screen. Can you hover again? Uh, oh. hover again? Can yeah, you see it now? We can, but the type of pointer that you're using is a very small white dot. Yeah. Totally lost. Got it. Um, does anyone know how to change that? Hold on one second. Oh, you know what? I think I could in PowerPoint. Hold on. Let's see. Pointer options. Laser pointer. How's that? Better. Perfect. Thank okay. you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I see here how it's funky on the left. It's a left bundle branch block. Or you can say I'm turning my turning my turn signal down, so it's a left bundle branch block. And then the other thing is that left bundle branch blocks looks like deep PVCs in V1, V2, V3. So that's another way that you could you could look at it. So again, here's another one. Where is it funky? So it's sort of funky here, sort of funky there. It's sort of like a notched look. Uh, so that would be a left bundle branch block. The turn signal is down, so it's a left bundle branch block. There's deep looking, there's deep looking PVC looking in V1 through V3, left bundle branch block, as opposed to a right bundle branch block. Now I know everyone learned about rabbit ears. I mean, I, I've yet to see a rabbit that looks like that. Um, this poor rabbit had one of his ears fell off or something. Um, so the rabbit ear thing never helped me. But when I look at this, I say, okay, is it funky on the right? Or is it funky on the left? To me, it's funky on the right, right? It's sort of notched looking. So it's a right bundle branch block. And then I could say, okay, I'm turning the turn signal up. So I'm turning right. So that's a right bundle branch block. And again, here, you know, the same thing. It's sort of, it has that funky notch look on the right. So it's right bundle branch block. 
Again, this is where the rabbit ears would fail you because this rabbit only has one ear. Uh, it's, but I'm turning the turn signal up, so I'm making a right-hand turn. So is this right or left? So I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, is it funky on the left or is it funky on the right? It's funky on the right. And I'm turning the turn signal up to the right. And again, this rabbit don't have ears. So I, you know, I, I never, I never got that. I mean, I do get it. I get what they're saying. Um, when you do see that nice little rabbit ear effect, but my point is that you don't see that a lot. I mean, here's what I was talking about, that deep PVC look. If you want, right? So that makes it very, very easy. But here they're funky on the left. And I'm turning the turn signal down like I'm turning left. Now, you could have like a mixed appearance, which kills my theory. Um, so you sort of look at this and... Uh, so my way only works 99% of the time and my way work, you know, maybe it doesn't work for you, but it works for me. But here it's funky both places, but everyone can see how turning, I'm pointing it up to the turn signal. So I'm turning right. So it's a right bundle branch block. And I don't have a deep PVC look in V1, V2, V3. Again, here I have that deep PVC look, V1, V2, V3. So it's a left, and it's also, I'm turning downwards, so I'm turning to the left. So again, let's, let's go back and look at these and see where people might get confused. So here we said, okay, this is a, a bundle branch block, right? There's a left bundle branch block, and you might say, oh, well, I have this SC segment elevation. Maybe they're having an anterior MI. And then you're like, okay, hey, well, and I have some ST segment depression. And so I have some reciprocal changes. But again, they have a left bundle branch block. Now, let me tell you, again, for every single thing in the world, there's always some outliers. There are criteria, um, Scarboza criteria. It's like SG, however they spell it. You can Google it, but you'll see how it's it's not gonna, it's 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 sort of someone's analysis of EKGs where they saw some morphology things that even though the person that left bundle branch block, they still were having a STEMI. I think for, for our purposes, if the person has a concerning EKG and you tell the hospital that they have a, a left bundle branch block and you're not sure if it's acute or not, you know, that satisfies our needs. And that satisfies the ER's needs as well. That satisfies our patient's needs. So if you're going to start ripping into this EKG and trying to figure out now, is that this and goes down a little here before it goes up? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to remember that on a, on a regular basis. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I think we're pretty safe just following uh, our criteria, that the, just the general criteria we look at when we look at left bundle branch blocks, you know, being sort of makes it more challenging to read the EKG. So, you know, if we look through each of these, you can, again, you can see how someone might get a little confused, but not, they're not that confusing, right? I mean, the, the, I don't think, is it, you know, this one, the right bundle branch block, maybe you're going to say, okay, there's SC segment elevation inferiorly, and then, and then you're going to say, okay, high lateral wall. It looks like they're having a, it looks like they're having some S segment depression, but they have right bundle branch block. Now, here's the thing though with right bundle branch blocks, you could have full blown, you could have a full blown STEMI appearance in a right bundle branch block, and that's a STEMI. Okay, so acknowledge the fact that it's a right bundle branch block, but if it looks like the real deal big time, then that is a STEMI and they have right bundle branch block. What I'm trying to say is over here when it's just little subtle nothings that people overread. I mean, here you don't even have SC segment elevation, but you sort of have this, this, this feel that someone's gonna get when they look at that. That's what I'm talking about as far as in misinterpreting a right bundle branch block for a STEMI. So <clears throat> the next thing is, is left ventricular hypertrophy. And left ventricular hypertrophy is a, is a very common 
reason for people to think that someone's having a STEMI when they're not. So this is like, remember, this was like the number one thing that people thought was a STEMI and it wasn't. And so here's, here's the, the, the deal. It's very, very, very common when someone has left ventricular hypertrophy for them to sort of have the ST segment elevation appearance V1 through V3 or V4. And it's 99.9% .9 of the time they have an ischemic appearance in the lateral leads, meaning one in AVL, V5 and V6. So that is like across the board, very, very common. That's what you see. So how do we know the person has LVH? So the the down and dirty way that we learned in school, and, and then there's the, the very, very easy way. The very easy way is when you have the QRS complexes uh, superimposing themselves on each other or going off of the paper, they got LVH. Okay, I mean, there's, there's, and a lot of time you see that, right? The QRS complex from from V6 is going into V5, and V5 is going into V4, and V4 is going off the paper, or going into the words on top. That is LVH. Now, the the sort of the down and dirty criteria is that if you take the tallest R wave at a V5 and V6, the tallest R wave in V5 and V6 plus the deepest S wave, meaning the negative deflection in V1 and V2, and you add them together, noting that each little box is one millimeter, each large box is five millimeters. If you have greater than or equal to 35 millimeters, then meaning you have, you have seven large boxes or 35 little boxes, of the deepest S wave in V1 and V2, plus the tallest R wave in V5 and V6, if that equals 35, then you have LVH. And so, and you may also have left, left axis deviation, which we, we uh, I have some slides that we could talk about what that means. So you can see here how, again, this is, so deep that it's going into the QRS complex below it. This one's so tall, it's going into the QRS complex above it. You don't have to take out your little measuring mind to know that person has LVH. And this sort of look of ischemia is what you see when the person has LVH. And so you can see though, how if someone buys into the water slides, or sometimes it may even not look like a water slide. It might kind of have a hammock appearance. Then you can see how someone might say, oh, I think this person's having a STEMI when they're like, oh, I have, you know, sort of septal and maybe a little bit anterior ST segment elevation. And in the lateral areas, I have ischemia. That person's having a STEMI and they're not. Now, is it possible? that someone who has LVH is can also have an MI. Yeah, you could have structural heart disease and you could have sort of coronary artery disease um, together. Uh, but generally, if you get this EKG and you send it to the hospital, you would say that I'm, I'm not calling this a STEMI, the person has LVH, right? And then they, they could look at it and if they think there's a full-blown STEMI, then that's fine. But uh, other than that, you you just, you told them the EKG looks like there's like there's LVH and then that's the end of it. So again, here's another example where you can see how each of these are going into each other. One's going off the page or into the, into the words. But if you start adding them together and you take this tall one right here, plus this one right here, you end up with greater than 35. When we talk about left axis deviation, we're talking about positive in lead one and negative in AVF. And we'll run through that because you see that on top of the EKG a lot. So it was a good sort of a, a place to put it 
to understand what axis deviation is talking about. So let's just talk about axis deviation for a minute, just for fun, because we have a little bit of extra time. We don't really, but we'll make extra time. So remember from school that dreaded Einhoven's triangle, but remember though some of you are more seasoned than others. And remember back in the day when you were able to take the paddles and you were able to make your own leads. And we know that lead one was from the right arm to the left arm. And we know that if we wanted to make lead two was right arm to the foot. And we know if we wanted to make lead three, it was from the left arm to the foot. And so we could make that triangle. So this was lead one, this was lead two, and this was lead three. And how does the energy flow through the heart? Well, we're gonna move those lines in and so we're going to then make, we're going to make this little picture with degrees on it. <clears throat> and so this is called access. Some people argue, you know, access cardiology is a thing of the past. But why do you put one AED pad on the low left and one on the high right? Because you're shocking against the access of the person's heart, which normally they goes like this, right? It works its way this way. And so when you, that's why when we wanna look at what's the best lead to look at, we wanna know what rhythm the person's in, lead two, right? So this is the person's normal access. And so if I was a, a catcher and I want to catch that access, that energy from going to the person's heart, I'd stand down here. So normal access is in this area right in here. Now, what happens is lead one, lead two, and lead three. Now, here's the deal. Here's our EKG machine. And we're going to look at lead one because lead one is most towards the top of the person's heart. And we're going to look at AVF, which is most on the bottom of the heart. And what we want to know is how is the energy flowing through the heart? So if the energy flows normally through the heart, it's flowing where? It's flowing towards lead one and towards the foot. Because this is towards lead one and towards the foot. So it goes like that. It's going towards lead one. Now, everything that comes towards the EKG machine is positive above the line. And anything that goes away from the EKG machine is negative. So if the energy is traveling like this, it's towards lead one and it's towards the foot. So lead one and AVF, AVF is foot, are both positive. Okay, so does everyone see that? We'll back up. If it goes towards the EKG machine, the normal flow, lead one is up because it's going towards lead one and it's going towards the foot. So it's going to be up in AVL. That's normal access. Now, what happens when this heart right here is all thickened? or dead muscle, what happens is the energy reroutes and it goes like this because it takes the path of least resistance. So yes, some energy gets through here, but the bulk of the energy derails. So let me ask you this, is this going towards lead one? Yes, but is this going towards the foot? Absolutely not, it's going away from the foot. So in other words, when the energy derails because of outpouching or thickness or deadness of the ventricle, you get left axis deviation because it's going towards lead one, but it's going away from the foot. So it away from the foot makes AVF negative because remember, things that go towards the EKG machine is positive Things that go away from the EKG machine is negative. 
and right axis deviation, you get it goes this direction, right? So it ha hangs out going this direction. So is it going towards lead one? No, it's going away from lead one, but it's still going towards the foot. So it's down in lead one and it's up in AVL. Now, there's something called extreme right axis deviation. What would make this happen? Almost nothing. And that's why sometimes the machine will say to check your leads. And that's because it would be very, very unusual for the electricity to hang a UE. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? No. So it wouldn't be normal for it to go away from lead one and away from the foot. So when lead one and AVF is negative, the machine says, hello, you put the leads on wrong. Take a look. All right, so that was our little talk about access. And so in left, left ventricular hypertrophy, when it gets bad enough, you see how thick this ventricle is? It takes too much time for the energy to go through there easily, and it goes off this way and causes left access deviation, where right ventricular hypertrophy causes right access deviation. Okay, so that's... That's hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. And then again, you could see why it gets confusing. The next one I have that can mimic an MI is ventricular pacemakers. Because if someone's V paced, and again, we don't necessarily see the nice spike, but they definitely have a pacemaker, it looks like what? It looks like SC segment elevation. Now, again, generally it's water slides. So generally you shouldn't get you shouldn't get tricked. However, it sort of has all the looks of ST segment elevation MI. It sort of follows anatomy, sort of. You know, you have ST segment depression here. I mean, I'm not gonna buy that that you have that you have it makes sense anatomically because this would be a right coronary artery issue, and this is gonna be a left coronary artery issue. But you can see how someone would get confused that the person's having a STEMI when it doesn't really hold true with the rest of the stuff we've talked about last time and, and early this time. But you can see where someone's mind might wander into that trap of thinking it's a STEMI. Now, this one, this is where I find very challenging. This is the one, if you're gonna get it wrong, get it wrong here with this EKG because you know I, I can't tell you what that is. So sometimes ventricular arrhythmias and aberrant rhythms, they will mess with your brain. And especially when they get faster, you know, we, we don't know. And so we know that someone could have be having a ventricular arrhythmia because we're having an MI. So you know, this, this is the one that gets really, really challenging. And so, you know, sometimes in the in the emergency room, you give the person some beta blocker IV and you slow them down and you try to figure out what it is. But when I look at this one, I, I'm looking at it. And if you, you sort of break into neighborhoods, it, it, it sort of adds up, right? I mean, I have S-segment elevation here. I have depression here, depression all throughout here. I have elevation maybe looking over here. So we know that this and this go together. We have reciprocal changes to support it. You know, again, I, I don't know. This this one turned out to be uh, an aberrant type of a uh, type of an AFib, but again, I can't say that I wouldn't call this in as a STEMI. So I, I think that if you if if you got if you got that one wrong, I don't think anyone's going to fault you. Uh, again, I found out what this was in hindsight. Uh, this is a tough one. So those to me are the toughest ones. Trying to figure out if it's a if it's if it's an arrhythmia that's taking a, a funny direction or if it's a STEMI. Now, if again, you know, your your patient's diaphoretic and they're holding their chest and they look like garbage, and, and you're like, oh my gosh, again, I still don't know. Is this arrhythmia related 
or is this STEMI related? And it's it's a tough one. So again, I find this one the most challenging. Uh, it's it's really hard to find literature to help uh, sort out and tease out uh, which way to go with it. Uh, but this was the actual patient of mine, and it's 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 a challenge. Early repolarization. There question, there's a question or two. Yeah. Somebody yes. said the last one, sawtooth. Shannon, I don't know if you want to come off mute. Or are you trying to identify the pattern? It looks like sawtooth to you. Is that what you're saying? And then, then while she chimes up, another person said, was uh, going to ask on this one, treat the patient? Treat the patient? That would no. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. So the thing is, but if this patient's having, right, this patient's having chest pain, this patient is, right, so, so the patient's diaphoretic, the patient doesn't feel well. Um, so yeah, so we're going to go through the whole standard standard treatments that we're going to do for for the person. If we think that it's it's a it's a it's an arrhythmia problem and it's acute, obviously if they're unstable, they get cardioverted. If they're stable, they can get other medications. Uh, that's where in the ER they have the luxury of of IV beta blocker if the person's going to tolerate it. Um, but again, what I'm what I'm getting at as far as this one is do. Am I going to call it in on the radio as a STEMI alert? That's kind of where I was getting at. So I, I, I would call this one in. My, you know, if I saw, if I had this patient, I would call it in as, as a suspected STEMI. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell if it's a STEMI or if it's an arrhythmia base. That's what that's what I was getting at. Does that make sense? Okay, early repolarization is another one. And early repolarization is it's probably, uh, to me, even though they didn't talk about this as the most common, but to me, it was always very common that I would show a cardiologist an EKG and they'd sort of like, they wouldn't even stop. They would keep on walking and tell me, you know, they'd mumble early repolarization and keep on walking. So um, early repolarization, I think, is, is, is more common than they were uh, suggesting. Uh, early repolarization, you see it in, in younger people a lot as well. And so I'm not saying a 24 year old can't have a STEMI, but 24 year old usually doesn't have a STEMI. Uh, so how do we pick out early repolarization? So you can see how this person has what looks like ST segment elevation. But if you look right there, you see that little notched wave. And that little notched wave and you'll see different people call things different uh, J wave, but basically when the notch is causing it to not be a water slide, when the notch is what's making it not be a water slide, that's early repolarization. So early repolarization, you typically see uh, a little bit of a, of a deep end uh, QRS complexes, but the, the thing here is, is that when I look at this, the, what's what's making it concerning for ST segment elevation that doesn't look like a water slide are those little notched waves. And so that is going to be a uh, concern. That, that's what's going to tell me that I think that the person is having, it has what's called early repolarization, which is normal. So you could have diffuse ST segment elevation so in other words, it's in areas that don't fit in to our patterning, so to speak, as you have here. So here you have issues in areas that don't add up anatomically. So right away, that's gonna sort of nix this from my calling it in as a STEMI. But when you see these little notches, then it's pretty straightforward that this is early repolarization. Pericarditis. So pericarditis fools people. And you know, often people go to the cath lab and they come out and you see written in the chart that they're going to start on a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. And that's because everyone got fooled into thinking that it was something else when it was pericarditis. And so when I look at this case, I can see where I have ST segment elevation, but again, it's diffuse and diffuse is global and not focal. So you wouldn't ever 
necessarily in this example get into that trap. So the ones that go to the cath lab, they don't look like this. Okay, they're a little less obvious as far as the pericarditis, but pericarditis has some, some pretty straightforward things. You can have diffuse SC segment elevation, PR depression, and that's why I tell people when you're measuring your isoelectric line, always measure it from before the P to before the P, because that way you'll notice that there's PR depression and a flip T wave is common in V1. So those are some sort of, this is textbook case that we had of some of pericarditis. But again, you can see how someone might get into that trap, but if they follow through each of the steps we talked about before, they really shouldn't get into that trap because this wouldn't make sense anatomically to have one culprit lesion because you have so many different areas that have problems that would be a different blood vessel. So we really shouldn't, in this case, ever think that this person's having a STEMI. And then artifact, as I showed you the example before. So when, when your EKG is rolling like a roller coaster, don't get sucked into reading it. So get another one that's a nice clean one. Because when you look at this, you can see why someone thought it was a STEMI. Again, I showed you that that this is the number one reason why the machine gets it wrong is from artifact. And so we don't want to get into that trap and think that there's SC segment elevation when there's not. Hyperkalemia, as we talked about before, the uh, when we we're talking about the machine interpreting T waves uh, and sort of making that ratio uh different as far as the machine missing things but this is this is sort of very different though than than the machine missing something hyperkalemia is when you see these peak t waves i think this patient of mine had like a a, a potassium level of like 7.6 or 8 or something like that you know they they say that the in the emergency room they say that the ekg is the poor man's lab right you get this one one penny ekg and you can tell if the person needs emergent dialysis versus not. So you can pretty much tell by the EKG or you, you really care when the EKG is showing problems of hyperkalemia. But you can see again how someone would look at this and be like, oh my gosh, this person has this yanked up ST segment and this and that. But it's really only because this whole thing is yanked north from these peak T waves. Uh, so again, does this make sense anatomically? Not, I mean, it's really pretty diffuse, and you really shouldn't you really shouldn't get sucked into that trap into thinking this is a STEMI. So again, we talked about uh, things that that mimic a STEMI. Uh, just in review, left bundle branch blocks, which could be an MI in their own right, left ventricular hypertrophy, which was a big one, V paste arrhythmias which are probably the most challenging, at least to me, early repolarization, which is pretty common, pericarditis and artifact. So uh, just because I threw this up here because uh, Dr. Barinholtz mentioned to me that it was a uh, sort of a concerning topic. Uh, and so I put this, I put this in here just because I, I happened to have this patient last Saturday night. And there's something called Wellens criteria. And just note to self, if even though this person doesn't really have ST segment elevation, that's very much. But when you have the sort of biphasic T wave, that's a concern. So when your T wave becomes a biphasic T wave, so it comes down, but then comes super down, the next step with this person usually is to have this hugely deep T wave. That's concerning for something. Okay, the, the person that I had, it wasn't actually an MI that they were having. Uh, what they actually had was no blood in their body because they had uh, orthopedic surgery and they were uh, beyond profoundly anemic. So if you don't have blood running through your heart, then you are gonna have ischemic looking uh, EKG appearances. But that's just, some, just note to self. And again, I... I 
I think that all of us would look at this and say, oh, that's not normal. And so if you have a patient who has this, you know, it's not a STEMI, but you're not going to look at this and say, oh, yeah, they're okay, right? Your next thing is going to be, you got something very wrong with you, right? I mean, it depends how you talk to your patients, but you have this patient has something very wrong with them. And it's not, it's clearly not a refusal. Uh, again, it's not, it's not a STEMI, but it's a concerning sign on, on an EKG. So let's spend uh, three more minutes together. So I know this one's hard to see, but when I look at this, do you see how this goes way up? This is going way up to here, the curious complex. This one goes way down. So what do I think of this EKG? Do I think the person's having, if I'm concerned for a STEMI, maybe they have ST segment elevation, they have some inverted T waves. Am I concerned? And then I'm giving my EKG a final hug and say, yeah, well, they have huge left ventricular hypertrophy. And so I think that's what it is. Can you re-emphasize your comment why that prior one is not a left bundle branch block? Because somebody chimed in that they thought it may be. Um, which one? This one? Yep. Nope. Well, let's count. No, not that one. Oh, not this one? Nope. The LVH one. Oh, this LVH one? Oh, because it's a narrow curious complex. Right. So... It's it's much less than three small boxes. I mean, this is pretty narrow, right? Good. And I think maybe on V4 and V5, just because we can't see the QR spike, it looks like there may be like this, yeah, a QRS a divided. Yeah. So, without that spike, yeah. it almost looks like a, a left bundle branch morphology. Oh, I see what you're saying down here at the baseline. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so this... It's hard to see just because, you know, I had all these different versions of scanners throughout the years. And yeah. this was the earlier, earlier version of a scanner that I had. But this QRS complex goes off the paper. So it's like off the charts. Right. Good. And so that's big time LVH. What do we think about this one? So do I think they're having a big MI? And they got big SC segment elevation all over the place. Well, it wouldn't work anyhow because it doesn't make sense anatomically. But let's say you got sucked into that trap. And then I give my EKG my final hug. And I notice that. So they have, now this is, is wide, wide, and it's going down. And so this person has, and they have these deep PVC look. So this person has a left bundle branch block. You know what? Hyperkalemia. <laughs> this person has hyperkalemia. <laughs> this person has hyperkalemia. I stand corrected with myself. It looks like it's even drawing it out, right? It's the string on top of the T that eventually the T. Yeah. Is, and then the QRS widens a little bit. It looks pretty significant here, but that's so funny. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll correct we'll myself give, there. We'll give you one out of 10,000 or so. <laughs> All right. How about this one? So again, look, look, you'll notice those little notches. And so I'm going to go with early repolarization on that. Here are our choices. Pericarditis, someone says. So, you know, I, I was I was looking at that 
when I was, that's why I was pausing for a minute. I don't really see PR depression. Um, I do sort of see that little notch look right there. You know, maybe it's not the best example of, of anything, but I guess the take home message is that it's not, it's not a STEMI, right? So, you know, here you have those little notches in early repolarization. Um, you definitely see that diffuse look. But again, the purpose is that we could say STEMI versus not STEMI. Because all we have to look at is this, this poor patient and the 12 lead EKG. So this one probably jumped out at you now that we made that error before. Again, you can see where someone starts getting sucked into the trap of the STEMI. And what does this person have? They have a left bundle branch block. And this one, you can clearly see the pacer spikes. But the problem nowadays is you don't necessarily see the pacer spikes because the way the, the leads are. So you have these, you have unipolar leads back in the day, and now you have bipolar leads. So the the lead for the pacemaker is grounded by into the end of the lead itself. So you have it's bipolar as opposed to back in the day that it would sort of sort of uh, ground itself to the what was called the can. And when it did that, you saw this big spike. And now you don't see spikes unless you tell the machine or the machine figures out there's a spike, but the machine's not really seeing the spike. And so it's a lot more challenging nowadays. So, you know, if you're if you're not sure if there's a pacemaker, then feel, ask the person, do they have a pacemaker? Because this one, you can see that the person's V-paced. So that's all I have. I, I appreciate everyone joining. I think we're about out of time anyhow. Uh, hopefully you picked up some clinical pearl somewhere tonight. Uh, but again, everyone does, according to the literature, we do a great job pre-hospital. But the idea tonight was that we could always strive to do a little bit better. Awesome, Matt. Awesome. I love the approach. I've used it so much. The turn signal left and right I use all the time. That's how I teach my residents. This is so well thought out and put together. All the thank yous are rolling in. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Everyone have a good night. Appreciate you. Take care of yourself. You too. In touch. Hey, you guys, we put the link out in the sign up in the link in the chat. Uh, if you want your MIMS CEUs, click on the link. Uh, I'll get it in one second. Hold on one second.